isn't God always rescuing the rescued? Isn't God constantly saving the saved? Isn't God every day delivering the delivered? He cares, he knows, and he's rescuing. I would imagine that almost all of you can think of a moment, whether it was close to now or even some time ago, where you were overwhelmed to the point of tears, crying in grief and in pain. Questions, troubles, disappointments, betrayals, hurt, crying. I, God, I'm stuck. I don't know what to do. I trust that you can remember that time. And while you suffered, you wonderful child of God, he was collecting every tear, putting it into a bottle of memory, marking every tear down because of his care and desire for your good. You and I couldn't feel that in the moment. Maybe we knew it and maybe we were trying to comfort ourselves by these truths, we were believing this, but did we know that? Well, in some ways, yes, but we didn't feel it because we were really having a horrible way. I was there too, crying, broken, scared. What next? What's even happening? And God in his grace, behind the scenes, collecting every tear, counting every tossing, mindful of every need and every hurt, behind the scenes, doing his work. Brother and sister in Christ, adopted son and daughter of the king, he cares, he knows, and he's rescuing. Isn't God always rescuing the rescued? Isn't God constantly saving the saved? Isn't God every day delivering the delivered? He has saved us from our sins by the merit of Jesus Christ through repentance and faith. He has caused us to be born again and he saves us and protects us all of our days. We don't always see it. We can't always experience it in real time, but we can go to the book and believe there's true and know that he has promised us that in Christ Jesus. If he was willing to slay his son on the cross to make us born again, how will he not also freely give us all things in Christ? Which is a daily deliverance, a daily rescuing. I know you're struggling with this temptation. He can overcome it like that. I know that you're at the point of despair. He can overwhelm it. He cares, he knows, he's counting, he's writing, he's collecting, and he's working behind the scenes. So what's beautiful about David is David says, I trust in your word and I'm gonna march forward in righteousness and faithfulness. Righteousness and faithfulness. I'm gonna do the right thing. I'm gonna be right by you today, God. Do the right thing and be right by you today so that he is glorified because God is rescuing. And this wonderful reality is that God not only rescues, but God rewards. God rewards. Do you remember when we read verse 23. Again, what are the first three words of 1 Samuel 26, 23? The Lord does what? He, he rewards. And rewards what exactly? It says it right here. This is David's testimony. He's like, yeah, I'm not going to go back with you, Saul. That wouldn't make a lot of sense. But I do trust in God, and I trust him for his word, and that we've done what's right. And I know that the Lord, 1 Samuel 26, 23, rewards every man for his righteousness and faithfulness. This is just an extraordinarily powerful and beautiful truth of the scriptures. You can join me in Hebrews 11 uh, verse 6, but let me set up 11 verse 6 because Hebrews 11 6, because God's willingness to overwhelm you with reward is a fundamental aspect of Christianity. I'm going to prove this to you from Hebrews 11.6. I'm absolutely uh, shocked and disappointed that the doctrine of reward is not an active element of Christian teaching across the broad spectrum of pulpits and sermons. 
And what we're going to see in Hebrews 11:6, 6, just as an illustration of the importance and significance of reward, helps us to underscore why and how reward is so important. So again, David confesses it all the way back in the first century, first millennia BC. But here in Hebrews 11, the chapter on faith, there's a foundational statement about those who would be born again. Do you see Hebrews 11:6? 6? I hope that you do. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God, that is whoever would be a Christian, must believe that he exists. Okay, that's pretty foundational, isn't it? You with me? This is at the very basis of this. That he exists and that what he rewards those who seek him. That's remarkable. And a period. Wait, wait oh, sorry. Okay. So whoever the author of Hebrews is, we'll find out soon enough. We'll be in his presence. It'll be great. Be like, it was me. I'm like, what? No way. Yeah, we don't know. And so the author of Hebrews, he's like, okay, if you're going to be a Christian, two foundational theological realities must be firmly established in your mind. Number one, that he exists, that he's alive, that he's real, that he's master, king, and ruler. He exists. He, in essence, reigns. He is filled with existence, which means he rules over all. So it's not just that he is, but that he is who he is. He exists, but the second thing that we need to know about him is that he's a rewarder of those who seek him. That's beautiful. I, so much is being said here, and by David. Let me consolidate it to this point. Our God is an inexpressibly generous God. Okay, so David says, who's going to get rewarded? What were the two adjectives? The person who is what and what? Who is righteous and faithful, right? You get that? He's like, that person gets rewarded. Now, let me ask you this question. You believer, have you, do you have righteousness and faithfulness? Please say yes. Yes, believer, you have righteousness and faithfulness. Where did it come from? From him. So track with me here. So God... By his grace, he who knew no sin became sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. 2 Corinthians 5.21. God, in salvation, wraps us with Christ's righteousness. That's amazing. And the gospel says, walk in it. Do that thing. Be righteous. Love the church. Make disciples. Serve, pray, evangelize. Walk in his righteousness. It's been Christ's righteousness has been given to you. Now do that. And when you do that, God says, I'll reward you for walking in the righteousness that I gave you. That's generous. Sign me up for that plan. But let's talk about faithfulness. So the, God rewards the righteous and the faithful one. Where did faith come from? The Lord. It's a gift. We didn't conjure it up. We didn't say, oh, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run the faith play. I, we didn't wake up one day and go, you know what, I think I'll believe in God. No, no one seeks God. No, not one. All of us are completely led astray by our sinfulness and foolishness. So God gives us faith, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. And then he says, the faith that I've given you, walk in it. And he does what for the person that walks in a faithful way? He gives them a reward. Friends, know it. Live it. One of the saddest conditions is a person that claims the name of Christ who says they've been wrapped in the robes of righteousness and been given the life-altering gift of faith, believing and trusting and relying on God, and sits there. That makes no sense. That's why Jesus says, um, what's with the guy who puts his lamp under a bushel, right? You never put a lamp under a bushel. It makes no sense because that would actually make a huge fire and the whole thing would burn down. So you wouldn't put your lamp under a bushel. You would actually let it shine. Let it shine, y'all. Walk in righteousness. Walk in faithfulness. Walk, know the joy of trusting God, obeying God, walking with God, and you will be rewarded in time and in eternity. Mark my words. Walk in what's right and good. Trust in God. Obey him with all of your heart. We're going to fall short in many ways. But as we seek to serve him and honor him by the power of his spirit and according to the precepts of scripture, reward. Whew. Remarkable.